Israel calls it its 70th anniversary, but Palestinians call it the Nakba. It is when Israel destroyed 530 Palestinian villages, displacing its residents, and replacing them with European Jews in an attempt to create a Jewish majority in the new Jewish state. Fast forward 70 years. Displaced and stateless, Palestinians can be found in Palestine proper, refugee camps in Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan, and many other regions. It was in 1948 when the Nakba, or the catastrophe, occurred. Acts of ethnic cleansing and genocide continue every day in Palestine since that day. By destroying Palestinian architecture and homes, Israel has emptied West Jerusalem of Palestinian culture and heritage. The next leap of ethnic cleansing happened yesterday. The move of the embassy, the US embassy, into Jerusalem. If the idea of no Palestinian natives in Jerusalem can be tolerated, can we tolerate the obliteration of the old city culture and unique characters from the pages of our collective human history? Let us start the conversation on the right of return. Palestinians are the longest standing refugees in the world. Those who have been displaced have a right to go home. In Gaza, Palestinians are marching nonviolently to the border to go back to their homes that they can see across barbed wire. That is the truth. Media can paint it as a show, as a cohesion, whatever. It is what it is. Young people resisting the blockade enforced on them and marching to go home, to be free and to be liberated. However, Israel is carrying out its Zionist agenda. Israel has decided that it will shoot our youth in the kneecaps and indiscriminately maim them. We are here to acknowledge 70 years of occupation, 70 years of exile, of settler colonialism, of injustice. We are also here to acknowledge 70 years of resistance. We remember today because we know it's the key to building our future tomorrow. Thank you. So we're going to go through the names out of the at least 108 Palestinians uh, who have been killed by Israeli forces since March 30th. We are going to read through those of whom we have names and ages uh, as of now. Uh, first, Wahid Nasrallah Abu Samur, 27. Muhammad Kamal Al Najjar, 25. Muhammad Naim Abu Amir, 27. Amin Mansur Abu Muammar, 22. Ibrahim Salah Abu Shar, 22. Abdul Fattah Bahjat Abdul Nabi, 18. Mahmoud Saadi Rahmi, 33. Sari Walid Abu Audi, 27. Hamdan Ismail Abu Amsha, 29. Jihad Ahmed Farina, 34. Ahmed Ibrahim Ashour Audi, 19. Abdul Qadir Murdi Al Hawajri, 42. Jihad Zuhair Abu Jamus, 30. Musaab Zuhair Al Salul, 22. Badr Al Sabah, 21. Naji Abdullah Abu Hujair, 25. Muhammad Al Rabi'i, 20. Faris Al Rakab, 29. Shadi Hamdan Al Kashif, 34. Ahmed Arafa, 25. Mujahid Nabil Al Khudri, 24. Majdi Ramadan Shabat. Ala Yahya Al Zamili, 16. Thair Muhammad Raba, 30. Hussein Muhammad Mahdi, age 16. Osama Khamis Kudi, 38. Ibrahim Al Ar, 20. Sitki Abu Atiwi, 45. Muhammad Saeed Al Hajj Saleh, 33. Yasir Murtaja, 30. Hamza Abdul Al, 20. Marwan Quddih, 45. Abdullah Muhammad Al Shahiri, 30. Muhammad Hajayla, 31. Islam Hirzallah, 
28. Abdullah Muhammad Shamali, 20. Tahrir Mahmoud Wahbe, 17. Ahmed Al Aqil, 25. Muhammad Ayyub, 15. Ta'ad Taha, 29. Ahmed Al Tahamna, 24. Ahmed Abu Hussein, 26. Azam Hilal Awaida, 15. Khalil Naim Atalla, 22. Muhammad Amin Al Muqayyad, 21. Abdul Salam Bakir, 29. Anas Shawqi Abu, Na Abu Asir, 19. Baha Abdul Rahman Quddih, 23. Muhammad Khalil Abu Raida, 20. Abdul Al, Al Dayim Abu, Mus Abu Musamah, 23. Jabir Abu Mustafa, 40. Azad Din Musa Muhammad Al Samak, 14. Wisal Khalil, 15. Ahmed Adil Musa, 16. Sa'id Muhammad Abu Al Khair, 16. Ibrahim Ahmed Al Zarqa, 18. Iman Al Sheikh, 19. Zayd Muhammad Hassan Omar, 19. Mautasim Fawzi Abu Luli, 20. Layla Al Ghandur, 8 months old. Anas Hamdan Salim Qutih, 21. Muhammad Abdul Salam Hartz, 21. Yahya Ismail Sail Rajab Al, Al Dakur, 22. Mustafa Muhammad Samir Mahmoud Al Masri, 22. Azil Din Nahid Aliyuti, 23. Mahmoud Mustafa Ahmed Asaf, 23. Ahmed Faiz Harb Shahada. Shahada, 23. Ahmed Awad Allah, Awad Allah, 24. Khalil Ismail Khanil Mansour, 25. Muhammad Abu Sitta, 26. Bilal Abu Dikka, 26. Ahmed Majid Qasim Atalla, 27. Mahmoud Abu Ma'amar, 28. Musab Abu Layla, 28. Ahmed Fawzi Al Titr, 28. Muhammad Maqdad, 28. Ubaida Farhan, 30. Jihad Al Farra, 30. Fadi Abu Salah, 30. Mautaz Al Nunu, 31. Muhammad Al Amudi, 31. Jihad Uthman Musa, 31. Shahir Al Madhun, 32. Musa Abu Hasnain, 35. Muhammad Abdullal, 39. Ahmed Hamdan, 27. Ismail Khalil Ramadan Al Tahuk, 30. Ahmed Mahmoud Muhammad Al Rantisi, 27. Ala Al Nur Ahmed Al Khatib, 28. Mahmoud Yahya Abdul Wahab Hussain, 24. Ahmed Abdullah Al Addini, 30. Saadi Saeed Fahmi Abu Salah, 16. Ahmed Zahir Hamid al Shawa, 24. Mahmoud, Muhammad Hani Husneen Najjar, 33. Fadl Muhammad Ata Habshi, 34. Mukhtar Kamil Salim Abu Khamash, 23. Mahmoud Wa'il Mahmoud Jundiya, 21. Abdul Rahman Sami Abu Matar, 18. Ahmed Salim Aliyan al Jaraf, 26. Mahmoud Sulaiman Ibrahim Aqil, 32. Muhammad Hassan Mustafa Al Abdaliya, 25. Kamil Jihad Kamil Mehna, 19. Mahmoud Sabir Hamid Abu Taima, 23. Ali Mahmoud Ahmed Khafaja, 21. Abdul Salam Yusuf Abd Wahab, 39. Muhammad Samir Duwedar, 27. Talal Abd Ibrahim Matar, 16. Omar Jumna Abu Ful, 30. Nasir Ahmed Mahmoud Gharab, 51. Bilal Badr Hussain Al Rasham, 18. 60 to 62 were un unidentified. There was no reason for these Palestinians to lose their lives. If you look at one of the posters here, we have Ahmed Al Adini, and on that is a conversation he had with a friend of ours in which he said, I wonder how we can chart a new path. I wonder how we can live a different life than what we're living now in Gaza. I commit to charting that new path and then dying to defend it when we get there. But he died before he could chart a new path. 
aside from all of these people who actually lost their lives, we know that more than 3,000 of them are wounded. And as we know, they were, they were shooting, uh, you know, right in the chest and in the head and on the legs and so on. A lot of these people cannot actually, they're maimed for life, really. They, they're going to have uh, their limbs amputated and, and so on. So their lives are already ruined, 3,000 3, more. What I'd like to start with uh, is a song called uh, Ya Wulad Haritna. It's actually a, uh, a revolutionary song that started back in 1936, before the Nakba happened, actually. And uh, I want you to join with me. So whenever you hear the word Yoya, I want you to say Yoya. So when I say Ya Wulad Haritna, you say Yoya. So let's, let's try it one more time, OK? Yo. What does Yoya mean? Yoya means, come on, let's go, let's, uh, let's overthrow. <laughs> no, actually, it's, uh, it's round, letting people to come out to demonstrate in front of, uh, at that time, in 1936, it was the British mandate and the British army, you know? So the Palestinians were struggling right before Israel, uh, Israel was created. We're talking about 1936. So, Ya ulad daharitna yo ya You got it. I think we we can do it. Let's do it. So it's going to go into many yoya. So I want you all to say yoya, and maybe we'll let people out there on the street hear it. Okay? Yeah. Let's do it. Ready? Ya ulad daharitna yo ya. Inna sabu taritna yo ya. Ya ulad daharitna yo ya. Inna sabu taritna yo ya. Taritna tir yo. share some poetry with you today. Is it on? It's not on? It's 
this better? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here today to mark with us this very important anniversary. I'm going to read three poems to you. The first one is by Tofiq Zayyad, who was born in 1932, one of the great Palestinian poets who experienced the beginning of the Nakba. So this is um, with our hats off to him and everyone else in that generation. Uh, Tawfiq Zayyad was a mayor of Nazareth and a very important poet. This poem is called On the Trunk of an Olive Tree. I shall carve my story and the chapters of my tragedy. I shall carve my sighs on my grove and on the tombs of my dead. I shall carve the number of each deed of our usurped land the location of my village and its boundaries, the demolished houses of its peoples, my uprooted trees. And to remember it all, I shall continue to carve all the chapters of my tragedy and all the sages of the disaster from the beginning to the end on the olive tree in the courtyard of the house. That was Tawfiq Zayyad. I'd like to read a poem that I've written. Um, this is to remind us that our struggle is part of the global struggle of many oppressed peoples. It's called, O oh, Palestine. O oh, Palestine, they've cut you up like a piece of cloth and made pockets for us to live in. They have taken our needles and bright threads and embroidered our history as theirs. Where do we sleep tucked away like that? Where do we play with our children in those cramped corners, smooth their thick hair and plant oranges for them to eat? How do we move to keep our muscles alive, our poems written, our schoolroom walls high? When can we stretch our necks and see the waves of the sea? Oh, Palestine, you've become a metaphor for everything that makes the world cry. Those with empty hands, brown and black skins, beautiful in their own languages. We are all you who are banned and deported, shot by police just for breathing, silenced with our fists, speaking. We have no lights in Gaza and San Juan, no food in Madras and Mumbai, our sacred land raped with a pipeline, our Rohingya bodies burned, our schoolgirls in Nigeria seized, our Palestinian children detained, jailed, checkpointed, rubber bulleted, denied the colors of a flag. Each of us hides things for safekeeping, our books in Arabic, Spanish, Farsi, and Urdu, our songs in Navajo and Zulu and Sioux. Oh, Palestine, together we huddle like sardines, make fire from the heat of our thin bodies, silver and fine, as fish in the Mediterranean multiply in the blue. We tell stories and keep them fresh, like evergreens aloft across the seasons. Our paintbrushes bleed colors. Our pens speak beyond jail cell cells and tear gas, guns, and walls. We vow not to listen to the soldiers' tales, dance to their people's music, offer them coffee, buy them meat and bread. We won't bow to their monuments. And one day they will know that their cloth can't make enough pockets for all of us, and we won't leave, and we won't die without them in their coffins beside us. Thank you. The last poem is very short. It's five lines, and it's an affirmation. I'd like you to say with me, Palestine is, and then I will answer you. So, Palestine is my father's birthplace before the war. Palestine is the sea, mountains, olive trees, time. 
Jerusalem's domes, weathered stones. Embroidered poppies, moons, and stars. Our sense of justice, our families return. Thank you. My name is Tamar Najia. I'd like to read a poem by Dr. Fawzil Asmar. Dr. Fawzil Asmar was uh, a local poet here who lived here in Bethesda and worked on 15th Street in DC. And he wrote a book, uh, many books. But this is one of his poems. Uh, and I want to pass a message that I think he would support. He would say, waking up in the morning is resistance. Being here today is resistance. Going to school is resistance. So thank you everybody for coming. His poem is called uh, Determination. Man, whenever you reach out to snatch my bread and the remaining rays of light in my eyes to dissolve some dream of mine, a remaining pride to delay a rising sun, deep in my loins you will only reach a dignity and a solid determination. Whip me, fetch more whips, more exec executioners by the thousands, turn my skin into shoe soles, rub salt in every wound, old wounds, new wounds, search my mind for every thread of a new image, of a new poem, take away the pen and the pencil with my blood I shall write every day a million songs. Thank you. I, I wrote a poem um, to remember all the fallen, um, to put words maybe about their despair. And it's called, I Don't Want This Life. That was an article in the Post the other day. I don't know if any of you read it, um, March, March. One of the uh, one of the protesters said, I don't want this life. And this poem is called, I don't want this life. The graveyards are full of me. Find me, a place before the stairs becomes more crowded, far from the elders who died a slower death than I. Lay me where I can see the innocence of the moon again. I'm safe at last from the mocking eyes that stare through sniper lens, aim at my legs but shoot at my heart. Lay me in the grave you will come visit, but it is I who have pity on you, for who would want this life? The waves are murmuring sinister plans over the shores of Gaza. While you sleep, but I will be at peace, Ummi. The fish that once zigzagged between my arms have turned into bullets. Silver scales become shields, become weapons. I do not trust the fish. Even the saltiness of the salt of the sea is lost in sewage. Let these sands wash over my footprints and erase me. The doors of the cage have led to another cage, have led to a prison. I'm free now, Ummi. You said things will get better. You said God will let us see the dawn, but our prayers are trapped in their echo. I don't want this life anymore. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Philip Farah, and I'm going to read from my father's diaries. Uh, he had daily entries, and I'm going to read with them from them mostly with a small introduction. My dad's name was uh, Gregory Farah, born in 1904. Um, he married very late, that's why I look so young. And uh, he uh, started writing daily entries in his diaries at the age of, uh, uh, in 1933. And um, the family moved to Jaffa after, um, they, they were born in Gaza, my father was, uh, and they moved to Gaza in Jeru uh, Jaffa in Jerusalem in 19... Okay. Um, okay. Uh, he worked for the customs in Bethlehem under the British colonial administration. He was also a partner in a pig farm, which did very well in the early 1940s. 
this is kind of important for the background. Start, he started keeping di daily diaries in 33. He was not really political at all, but he was religious, humanitarian, and very open-minded. He married my mom, uh, Mary Qamar, at the age of 40 in 1944. I, I want to pass around the pictures of the, uh, of the family house of the Qamars, which is in West Jerusalem in the neighborhood of Musrara. Uh, they lost everything in 1948, including the house, of course. Uh, the pictures are very new, and now it's, it's, there are Jewish families living in it, like thousands and tens of thousands of uh, family homes all over Palestine. He really was not nationalistic, and his friends were very different from different ethnic and religious backgrounds. His diaries reflect sympathy not only for the Palestinian victims of the violence, but for everybody, including the Jewish victims. But over time, his diary entries clearly reflect how the violence from the side of the Jewish forces, the Yeshuv, was greatly outdwarfing the violence from the Palestinian side. And with some reading of the history of the ethnic cleansing from such sources as Nur Masalha, Walid al Khalti, Ilan Pape, an Israeli historian, one can trace how the violence of the Jewish forces was aimed at maximum ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. So I'm going to start reading. July 22nd, 1946, the tragedy of King David Hotel. My brother Emil escaped narrow death. It was very pitiful indeed. Almost 50 people killed. Actually, it was 91 people, 41 Arabs, 28 Britons, and 17 Jews. December 5th, 1946, the Jewish terror is increasing from day to day. Went to Habab's house, their friends, to congratulate them on the birth of the twins. Coming back, bombs were exploding on the same street as we were, where we were on. March 3rd, 1947. Martial law in Tel Aviv and parts of Jerusalem. It is feared that there will be reduction in staff. Now, at this point, they're really worrying about their jobs. Uh, March 5th, 1947, Jewish terror on the rise, threatening the whole country. June 16, 1947, Arab general strike. July 24, 1947, Jewish terror increasing. Sirens are sounding every day, today three times. At this point onwards, he's really mentioning how prices are rising like crazy. They're having a hard time uh, making en ends meet and that they are all worried that they won't have any jobs because things are getting so, so bad. Um, November 30th, 1947, partition of Palestine was today approved at the UN with a vote of 33 against 13. Trouble expected everywhere. The Jews are very happy and the Arabs are so sorry. January 21, 48, Musrara, the neighborhood of my mom, where the house, I hope you, some of you see well, that house. Bombs exploded while I was there. It is worse every day and people are running with their families to Syria and Lebanon. Now, a little introduction. Uh, on January 5th, 1948, in the Qatamun uh, Samir Amis Hotel, Qatamun neighborhood, there was a Samira Samir Amis uh, Samir Hotel. I mentioned this because this is the beginning of ethnic cleansing, which happened all over Palestine. Um, 25 Palestinians killed. The Haganah did this. Not the so-called extremist Zionist groups, but some so-called moderate Haganah. 25 Palestinians killed and the Spanish vice consul who happened to be staying there. So now he goes on February 3rd, 1948, to his tailor in Qatamun, a very dreary place, and most of the houses are empty. Everybody's gone. February 28, 48, no more safe to go to Bethlehem. Buses daily shot at from the Jewish Ramat Rahel colony. Now, April 20th, 1948, again, 
the ethnic cleansing, 10 days after the Deir Yassin massacre, people leaving Jerusalem, it is getting worse day, daily. It is too late for us to go to Gaza, his hometown, original hometown. There is no benzene, no kerosene, and people are really suffering. Saturday, April 24, terror and war all over the country. Haifa was beaten by the Jews, and now the ethnic cleansing spreads to Haifa. That's me at the day. Uh, people are leaving the country and leaving their houses in effect. Easter. Again, bombs everywhere. At this point, the family moves from, the, from outside the walls to the old city because it's safer. And they are given a room in the uh, uh, complex of the Lutheran church right next to the Holy Sepulcher. Uh, and there are 16 people crammed in one room. He's there with uh, my family, of course and uh, other relatives. May 15th, he actually started numbering the days anyway. This is the, fif the 15th, the infamous day. Bombs, fire, and mines all day. Oh God, have mercy upon us, miserable sinners. Who's kind of religious? Um, February, um, May 21st, eighth day. It is such a pitiful life, fire and explosions everywhere. Persons, 16 persons crowded in one room. These are the worst days. This afternoon, uh, on uh, May 28, this afternoon, the few Jews in the Jewish quarter sur surrendered after 15 days of great struggle. A scene of ruin and dismay in the Jewish quarter in the old city. May 30th, Holy Sepulchre, with, my, with his son, John, my brother. The most dangerous night, carrying Grace, my sister, at 8.30, when the most awful bomb exploded. It broke both lamps. Uh, by the way, the, the fuel spread, spread on the floor, and had my aunt not uh, uh, doused it with a the carpet, they would have all been burnt. But she was quick enough, because there was uh, gasoline uh, in tanks for storage. It would have been a huge disaster. Uh, we all escape narrow death. At this point, the Lutheran pastor allows them to go into the um, crypt underground in the church. Um, and now I'm going to switch to uh, 48. Uh, for, for, um, yes, well, okay. So the Haganah forces massacre, this is my notes now, uh, massacre in the city of Lidda, over one of the worst massacres that happened by the Haganah, by the way. Over 400 Palestinian men and children, 170 uh, were killed, 176 of them while taking shelter in the Dahamish Mosque in Lidda. The vast majority of the Palestinians on Ramli and Lid are ethnically cleansed. Now he's working, he gets a job, he hadn't, he'd been out of work for a while. He gets a job on the River Jordan at the crossing at the bridge, and he's talking about the situation at the bridge. Uh, July 14, 48. Very tiresome work here in this devilish place. We work till 12.30 a.m. and wake up at 4.30 with very little food. July 18, 1948, just a few days after the Lidda massacre, a scene of dismay and pity at the Allenby Bridge. Thousands of people running from all Palestine after the fall of Lidda and Ramla. A few days uh, later, he says, I wept several times on seeing the poor immigrants running away from Lidda and Ramla, where we had relatives, by the way, too. Um, yes, so now I'm switching um, my... Uh, my mother's uncle wrote a book because he, he himself was one of the victims of Lidda. And many of the people were killed in Lidda itself, but many died because they were forced by the Haganah to march all the way from Lidda to Ramallah. Terrible terrain. And my, uh, my um, uh, second cousin who wrote the book, 
he wrote about how people were dying uh, as they are out of thirst and exhaustion on the way and they had no water they were drinking their own urine some of them so my family were uh, so 800,000 people were um, forced out of Palestine. I want to switch now to go back to the time when they were in the Lutheran church, uh, because, so uh, I'm going back to May, uh, June 1. We again slept in the German church basement. Labor came to Fahima, my aunt, at 11.30 p.m. The, and that night, the first serious air raid tonight in the old city. June 2nd, this happy day at 10.45, Fahima gave birth to twins of male and female named Camille and Camelia, my cousins. Both are healthy and very lovely. They weighed 4.9 kilograms. The boy is slightly heavier. I mention this because it's the new generation. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm over time. Thank you very much. The song is about uh, Bism al so uh, I think a lot of the Arab speaking would know. Would know. Hurriya. Say Hurriya. Hurriya means freedom in Arabic. So, in the name of freedom for Palestinians, we're going to sing this song that's been sung many, 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 many years. Actually, when I was very young, <laughs> When we used to say, um, in Nakba was only 20 years old in 1968, and it kept on to 30. We're talking about 70 years now, okay? So when I say, Bism al I want you to say Hurriya uh, with me while I sing the song. I know all the Arabic speaking people will probably know how to sing along, okay? <laughs> not just to the Palestinians. And uh, Palestine needs to be liberated, and it should be... Uh, hello, yes. <laughs> and uh, so I want you... I think the microphone is, keeps going off and on, so we'll try to sing and, and get this song going. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
born in El Malha, which is a small town in um, Palestine. She was four years old when um, the 1948 occupation um, happened. And uh, my grandmother was 92 years old when she passed away. When she lived with us, I always asked her, Siti, why did you leave? Why did you leave? Why didn't you guys just stay? And she would say, Siti, we were too scared. Your mother was just four years old. Your, um, your aunt was just three years old and she was sick. If we had stayed, the people were coming and they were telling us of what, what went on in Dar Yassin. And we thought the same thing was going to happen to us. They were raping the girls and they were, this is exactly what she told me, they were raping the girls, they decapitated the, the men, they went in and um, they killed a lot of the young people and even in some cases, the women would come and tell us that some of the pregnant women had their stomachs cut and the kids would be taken out and if they survived, they would raise them. And then, of course, I was 10 years old when I came to the United States and some of these things are really far-fetched when you're 10, even though I went through the 67 war. But, you know, when she would tell me this stuff, it was hard to believe. And then when we came here, I saw Sidi, which is my grandfather, um, my mother's father, and I would ask him the same thing. He repeated the same things to me that he said. And then I got married, and my father-in-law lived through the Nakba, and he had the same stories to tell. So just to go back to 1948, my mother was four years old, my grandfather's name was Ahmed Judah, and he owned a big house with a big veranda. As you guys know, we're very social, so he was one of the elders in the town, and in comparison to other people in the town, he was well-to-do. So lots of people would gather on his porch every night, men, women, they would laugh, they would sing, they would talk about the happenings in the world, the happenings, in Al Malha, and he also had a grocery store. He always shared what he had in the grocery store with the people around him. Then when the Dar Yassin massacre happened and people started to move, they moved to through Al Malha, which is really in Jerusalem proper. And when you look back now, we realize that that was part of the ethnic cleansing strategy because Al Malha is less than two miles away from the inner town of Jerusalem. So I said, Sidi, what happened? He said, Sidi, well, they kept on coming and saying, your daughters, they're gonna be killed, you're gonna be killed, you're gonna, you need to leave. And I resisted as much as I could, but finally, the fear for me and the fear for my family was too strong to resist, and I just started walking as other people were walking too. So he left his beautiful house, he left the people, and he left everybody that he knew until they started to migrate with him. My mother, when I ask her now, she was four years old, she said, Yamma, when we left, my father held one hand and my cousin held my other hand. And when I looked up the hill where we were walking up, there were so many people, it looked like there were ants, as you look down from under. And then my father, talking, my mother talking about her father, he actually gathered dates, because he used to have dates in his store, and he distributed a lot of the food in the store to help the people that were moving so that they would have food to eat while they were moving through. She said, um, my great grandmother, my, my grandfather's mother, was really sick and when she heard that they would have to leave home, they got sicker. And the night that they actually left, that morning my grandfather had to bury his mother before he left and he left his mother behind. Really when my grandfather left, he told me, I didn't think that I was leaving and never coming back. I thought we would just be gone for a little while and we would go back. As it turned out, unfortunately, they kept walking, walking through the night. They ended up in Beit Lahem. And in Beit Lahem, most of the people that had migrated or had left ended up in a place which he called the woman's prison. He said it was a big concrete building with lots of rooms. Um, there was a little bit of electricity. There wasn't a lot of running water. But the amount of people that were there were so many that children had to sit in their parents' laps and that women and men were all in the same room, all of them sitting on top of each other because there were so many. I was telling you about my aunt. My younger aunt was sick. She had an eye infection and my grandmother had to carry her the whole way. My grandfather was scared that my aunt would, something would get worse with her. So he was trying to leave there because before he had my mother and my aunt, he actually had lost three daughters to illness. 
So he said, we got to leave here and go. So him, my grandmother, and my mother, and my uh, aunt left, and they just kept on walking. He said, we walked all the way through until the next morning. And then in the morning, we came to a town, and there was a lady sitting on a porch. And I said, Salaamu Alaikum. And she said, yeah, uh, yeah, Akhui, my brother, what are you doing here? How can I help you? And he said, we told her, look, my daughter is sick. My other daughter is only four years, four years old. And we really have nowhere to go. We left Al Malha because of what's happening over there. So we need a temporary place to stay. And the lady, you know, even though that now you look at me and you say, how did she trust? But she actually told him, you know what? I got a room. Come in with your family and you can stay with me. He said, we stayed there for three months. And um, Alhamdulillah, my grandfather was a little bit well to do, as I told you before. So he had saved some money and he said they had a lot of dates. So he used the money to live by for the next three months. And then um, my his mother is actually from Bira. And when, um, when she married, she married in Malha. And that's how she ended up in Malha. So the, his uncles on his mother's side came when they realized that he was in a town called Batir. They came to Batir and told him, what are you doing here? Your uh, mother's family is in Bira. Come to Bira and live where we can give you a place to stay. From 1948 and 1958, my grandfather and his family had to move four times to different places. And then finally, in, around the year 1958, my uh, paternal grandfather came to the United States and my maternal grandfather came here too. And then um, my paternal grandfather built and he gave his house to my maternal grandfather and then here we are today. Thank you. I just want to say something. Her village is Malha. Today, the Malha Mall, one of the most popular malls in Israel, sits on that land. So if you ever hear of Malha Mall, just know the history. Uh, I'm going to be retelling the story of Uthman Aqil, who is 76 today. This is his picture. He's from Deir Yassin. He was six years old when the massacre happened. Bread was a staple. Ooh. Bread was a staple then, and people didn't have ovens in their homes. So my mother would make the dough in the evening, and the bakers always came to our house to pick up dough and bake it for us. The day, this day, it was already 2 a.m., and the baker hadn't come by yet. So my mother sent me to check on things. When I got to the baker, I saw a woman on the ground with her hands up. Zionist men with guns in the bakery were yelling at the Palestinian baker and his child. They were holding the father, but the child was crying and terrified. The men with guns were yelling at the Palestinian baker to throw his son in the oven. The boy was screaming and shaking, please dad, don't let them. The baker refused, and the men with guns knocked the father out and threw the son in the oven. The woman on the floor was sobbing. The armed men then woke up the baker and threw him in the oven with his son. Uthman ran home and didn't say anything to the family. Today, 70 years later, his wife says he doesn't stop crying. 70 years later, his wife is from Jerusalem and she tells his story, the story of her meeting Uthman. She always hoped for romantic words, but all he ever talked about was Deir Yassin. He also has newspaper clippings from that day saved till this day. I will also be retelling a few statements made by other eyewitnesses at Deir Yassin. From Fahmi Zidan, who was 12 at the time, the Zionists ordered all of our family to line up against the wall and they started shooting at us. I was hit in the side, but most of the children were saved because we hid behind our parents. The bullets hit my sister Kadri, which she was four at the time, in the head. My sister Samir, who was eight at the time, in the cheek. My brother Muhammad was seven, and he it hit him in the chest. But all the others that were standing against the wall were killed. My father, my mother, my grandfather, and my grandmother, all my uncles and aunts, and some of their children. From Nana Khalil, who was 16 at the time, a man took some kind of sword and slashed the neighbor, Jamil Hish, from head to toe. Then he did the same thing on the steps of my house to my cousin, Fatih. 
Another statement from Safiya Atiya, who was 41. I screamed, but around me other women were being raped too. Some of the men were so anxious to get our earrings, they ripped out our ears as well. Many of these testimonies have been recorded in Israeli archives, but are not public. Good afternoon, everybody. I am going to sing a song I wrote about Rachel Corey. For those of you who don't know who Rachel Corey was, she was an, um, a palace, uh, an international solidarity network activist who stood in front of a bulldozer in Gaza to stop home demolitions and was killed when the bulldozer ran over her. This was on March 16, 2003. She was 23 years old. I'm going to read um, a couple of, um, of her quotes and uh, these, these quotes inspired me to write the song. <laughs> she wrote uh, to her parents sending an email from Gaza and this kind of inspired me to write the song. This has to stop. I think it is a good idea for us to all drop everything and devote our lives to making this stop. I don't think it's an extremist thing to do anymore. I still really want to dance around to Pat Benatar and have boyfriends and make comics for our co-workers but I also want this to stop. Disbelief and horror is what I feel. Disappointment. I am disappointed that this is the base reality of our world, and in fact, we participate in it. This is not at all what I asked for when I came into the world. This is not at all what the people here asked for when they came into the world. This is not the world you and Dad wanted me to come into when you decided to have me. I'd like to... I'd like to dedicate this song to all, all the people in Gaza who lost, who lost. Would you like to use this one? No, 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 this one right here. Check, check, thank you. I'd like to dedicate this song to all the people in Gaza who've lost their lives. And also, one thing needs to be said. 3,000 people were injured, but these people were, they using these explosive bullets that blow up their legs and they maim people and they become a, a, a mobility challenge for life. So it's not the, they're trying to keep down the casualty figures for people killed, but they're shooting at their legs and causing a lot of problems for people and then they're not letting them go to the hospital. So that's really what's going on. And so I dedicate this to all the people who are struggling in Gaza and I like to say, hasta la victoria siempre. To, uh, what Che Guevara said, until the victory always. <laughs>
but now I'm in a Gaza town and the bulldozers pushing the houses down. A bulldozer's coming up to push down a home. I'll stand right here with my megaphone. Stop where you are, you don't have the right. Where will the people sleep tonight? I think he'll stop, I feel the beat of my heart, but I'll stand right here and I'll do my part. Come on, the people now, I like to dance and have a lot of fun like everyone. But I want to take a stand and I know a way how to make this stop right now. Well, the man at the controls does not pause, but she stands her ground for the cause. The bulldozer made an awful sound, and it plowed young Rachel to the ground. They dug her up and they sped her away, but it was too late, she died that day. March 16, 2003 will be planted in our memory. Yeah. 
Thank you everyone for coming out. My name is Karim Hosseini with uh, American Muslims for Palestine. Uh, we helped organize this along with uh, our gracious uh, friends from uh, PCAP and uh, JPP. Um, I just want to say that we're all here today because we all know that Jerusalem and Palestine is always going to be Palestinian. And that for 70 years of occupation, there have been 70 years of resistance and there will continue to be resistance until Palestine is free. So, free Palestine! Again, I'm Philip Farah. I'm with the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace. I also want to thank you all for coming. And I want to tell you, ask you, please do something. Write your congressman, write your senator. Uh, do something in your church, in your mosque, in your uh, masjid, in your uh, synagogue. Uh, write to NPR and tell them they got it all wrong. Free Palestine. Quickly, uh, to close out quickly, I'm Leah from Jewish Voice of Peace DC. We're grateful for the opportunity to co-sponsor. I just want to say some words about boycott, divestment, and sanctions, if they weren't mentioned much today. If you find yourself outraged by what's happening in Gaza and in Palestine, remember that we give $3.8 billion a year in military aid to Israel. Um, we give diplomatic backing. We give the green light for continuing abuses. So as people in the United States paying tax dollars, um, and for us also as Jews moved by Jewish tradition to stand in solidarity with our Palestinian comrades, we work to end our many ways that we're supporting this system and instead push for justice, um, push for collective liberation. Um, so you can do that um, by boycotting different Israeli products. Um, learn more about connecting with us. We also have a campaign in D.C. to end U.S. Israeli police exchanges, occupationfreedc.org. Um, check it out. Um, do what you can to help free Palestine every day by ending your complicity. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Tweet and Facebook. Tweet and Facebook. Give them help. Write to uh, write to your um, write the media. I mean, if you see an article and it's a good article, look at the uh, the um, what is it? tagline. The tagline. There's always an email. Just drop an email that says thank you for writing this. Or if it's a bad article, write an email that says this was not a good article. <laughs> Do something. Facebook, tweet, do something every day. Easy. Oh,